Hey there! Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and welcome to another Media Matters special at Anfield Index. It's quiet in one way, you could argue, ladies and gents. It's International Week, but off the field, there's still many things to talk about. It feels like we're in the eye of the storm, doesn't it, before the fixture madness commences, which we've got to talk about as well. And here to join me, and we're going to put him on the block this week, big time in terms of his thoughts, ladies and gents, is the renowned and the respected as ever, David Lynch. David, international break. How are we? Yeah, good. It's nice to it's nice to have a bit of a break from the sort of you know it's really full on, isn't it? Sometimes when they get particularly because Liverpool have been basically playing every midweek and then weekend for the past few weeks. So nice to have a little break from it all. I actually managed to get away over the weekend as well. So now it's back into it, isn't it? And, and sort of head down and, and focus on Liverpool. So yeah, it's it's exciting though to it's stuff to look forward to. But yeah, nice to have a break ahead of the the real madness starting and and hopefully a couple more trophies to come. Yeah, that's been a nice break, but it does feel like the real business stuff starts now as well. And I mean, speaking of business, largely we're going to start talking about off the field as well, because I know you wrote a piece about it as well. And it's probably been the, the biggest story. So I do kind of want to break these down one by one. Richard Hughes is confirmed as a sporting director. If people do want to believe, like we said before, that he's going to start work on the 1st of June. I'll leave that to them realistically. But there has been quite a lot of detail. I know you'd written a, a piece about this because there'd almost been the thought that Richard Hughes is this almost a, an Edwards old pal act type of thing, but he has actually got quite a CV that stands up as well, doesn't he? Yeah, I mean, even on the surface of things, you know, even even without going sort of into in depth on on, on the piece that was written, I, I think you know, this, I think the surface level stuff looks good. I think Bournemouth's recruitment they do punch above the weight. There's no denying that. I mean, you look at. A, a team like them with a with an eleven thousand seater stadium yeah. that's managed to pretty consistently stay in the Premier League. They did get relegated, but immediately, almost immediately bounced back to you know two seasons in the Championship, and then straight back up. So, you know, clearly they're getting some decisions around that correct. And and then, like I say, even the surface level ones, the one we all know about, you know, Dominic Solanke is, is turned out to be a great buy. Which even at the time, people said you know the money, and, and he made a bit of a slow start, but he's since proven to be a great acquisition, they would make much more money on him if they were to sell yeah. him tomorrow. You know, Nathan Ake is another one, a really shrewd acquisition. And I look at some of the other signings they've made. I like that Kirkes they've got, who's playing left back, looks a really, really smart signing. Um, Utara looks good. Senesi, you know, I could list a load of players at Bournemouth who you think, wow, they've done really good, to, you know, done really well to sort of get them in yeah. because they are a higher value than they paid for them. They're, they're clearly Premier League level players. So, you know, I think I think even surface level, their their recruitment looks quite good. And then, you know, you hear about some of the stories. Then that you know, you, you get told about that, that some of the signings they missed out on down the years that yeah. they've liked. You know, players like Joe Gomez, they were in for him at the time. Harvey Elliott, uh, you know, competing with Liverpool for players of, of Liverpool quality. And you know, it is kind of hard to judge, isn't it, around sporting directors sometimes because you don't hear about as much the failures and the ones that they went for that would have been really shrewd acquisitions. So kind of nice to get an insight into those. And that gives you an idea, really, that along with the stuff that we do know that Bournemouth have pulled off, that they, they've consistently looked at the right type of player, which is players that are undervalued and, and that can be really good Premier League players. They've consistently looked in that in that area. So 
you know that that suggests to me that you know very much Richard Hughes is is has got a similar mindset in terms of uh, around recruitment as as Michael Edwards, and so yeah. not just coming into it because he's his mate, but also because he he thinks about recruitment in the same way, and he's got a really good eye for a player. And you know we we can make too much about the idea that you know that. The, okay, he's coming in to be the new Michael Edwards. And I think too much is made of Edwards and his player ID. It's not just one man picking players. That's not what is good about Richard Hughes. It's the methodology that leads him towards identifying these players. And he buys into doing things in a very similar way to Michael Edwards. And that is all Liverpool fans want really and should want really, in my opinion, is because it's not reliant on the genius of one man or, you know, his, his ability to pick out players. It's all about the idea that the, like I say, they buy into the methodology and that will then consistently get you the right players. So I think that's really encouraging. Yeah, definitely. And as you said, Bournemouth, who, who really have been punched above the weight. It almost feels like FSG might just save themselves time and buy Bournemouth the second club because the new one coming off the block is Mark Birchall, chief football scout. Now there's quite a few sort of suggestions of what role he'll take as people have mentioned hunters and fallow and the structure. Do you think there is anything to that in regards to Mark Birchall coming to Liverpool? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, some of the reports, I mean, I, I've not had the inside track on this one, I must admit, uh, but, but I obviously read some of the reports from the journalists we, we all respect and, 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 and seem to be a suggestion that Dave Fallows and, and Barry Hunter will, will, will stay in their position. So he's not coming in to sort of rival that. So he's going to fit somewhere in that structure. I, I, you know, it'd be interesting to see where, but again, Clearly, it's another figure who, you know, in much the same way with Richard Hughes, he's got a similar mindset around recruitment. He obviously believes in how they're going to do it. And for him, you know, great step up to to go to Liverpool as well. So that would be really exciting. So, uh, you know, I think, it, you know, if Richard Hughes is willing to bring him in, he obviously thinks he thinks about things in the, in the same way. And so he's obviously going to find a place for him in that structure. It's going to be interesting to see exactly what that entails and where he does sit in that and, and, and whether he's below... Uh, you know Barry and and, and Dave in, in terms of how that recruitment set up, but again, you know you've got to think that that it's a smart acquisition on the basis that he clearly thinks about football in the same way as Richard Hughes, same way as Michael Edwards, and if they're on the same page, then you're going to get you know clever recruitment, which is which is what Liverpool have been all about down the years. Yeah, and it, in a great way, it does seem like that's what they're setting up, up for link with Will Spearman, everyone's role. Yeah, the, the key people in the key positions, as it were. So, yeah, we'll await developments on that front as well. And International Week, you know, David, some people like it, some people don't. I mean, I'm going to be honest, I sit on the fence of, I don't watch internationals. I just pray Liverpool don't get injuries more than anything like that. I'm actually quite happy when our players don't play. For yourself as a journalist, is it, are you looking at the games more or is it a case of just keeping an eye out from Liverpool points of view more than anything? Yeah, no, just just checking in terms of injuries a lot of the time. Um, you know, sometimes watch England if it if it's on, but like I say, I've been away this weekend, so not paid attention so much football at all, if I'm honest. Um, but but I think, you know, there are some sometimes, you know, if they do all avoid injury and you fingers crossed that is the case because yeah. Liverpool don't need any more, but there can be upsides to it. You know, Cody Gakpo, by all accounts, just reading this morning, got a couple of assists against Scotland yeah, yeah. in a 4-0 win. He probably needed that confidence boost. You know, he's getting a lot of criticism at the moment. Some of it, I think, very unfair, actually. But, you know, that that, that will help him go away, play with a different team, get a couple of assists. Hopefully he gets his confidence back up and he can come back and, and have a strong finish. So there, there can be upsides to it. Uh, you just hope that Liverpool feel all of those and, and, and hopefully none of the downsides because... To be honest, they've been quite unlucky around international injuries in, 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 in across this entire yeah. season, really. So hopefully you can kind of avoid that because they, they've earned a bit of luck on that front, I'd say. Definitely. And the best news for me, and I, I know you wrote about this, so I did want to almost double check it, that Salah's not gone for the Egyptian friendly. That was good news. He was rehabbing. Sensibly, Uruguay made the decision not to take Darwin Nunes. So I think if, if I'm right, I read your piece that the expectation is he is that he's back for Brighton at the coming weekend as well. Endo had a game cancelled because of Japan, Korea, Republic game cancelled. So he'll be back early. I mean, that those are positives. And then at the same regard, and I would, I'd be interested with your take on this. Harvey Elliott, there's a lot of claims to get him in the senior England squad because he's form. That's the last thing I'm looking for. A young Harvey Elliott to be going to the Euros and playing minutes over the summer. How do you stand on that type of thing? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, in, in terms of 
Well, in terms of the the, the other players and, and having yeah. them back, I think that's that's really helpful. By the way, I mean, especially your forwards. I just think that you know, yeah, the the amount of running they do and closing down, and so it's so prone to you know sprinting after balls. It's so easy to get hamstring injuries. And Endo, another one, you know, the way he plays the game, really, really handy that he's not playing those international fixtures. So that that I think is great news. But on on Harvey Elliott, I think. I don't know. You know, I, I talk to him quite a lot in the mix zone and, and, and I know some of his family and I, I do sort of look at that and think it would be kind of nice for him to get the call up yeah. from from that personal level. I know it's something he would like and, and I feel like he deserves it. I, I find it bizarre, to be honest, that, that Kobe Mainu has, has got a call up ahead of him because I think, you know, Mainu, don't get me wrong, I think there's, there's real clear talent there. But in terms of the position he plays, he's got a lot to learn uh, I think in terms of that, you know, if he's going to play him yeah. in that holding role, he's not really ready to to contribute at, at what England think their level is or hope their level is at the moment, I would say. Whereas Harvey Elliott, I think he's absolutely ready to contribute in his position. I suppose the, the difficult conversation you have to have around that is, is you know, who does he come in for? And and, and that's, a, a, I suppose, a, a quite a difficult one. But I, I'm surprised that Harvey Elliott's played the amount of games he has for Liverpool at the level he has, and he's not been in and around the England setup. As you, as you say, there's benefits for Liverpool in that, in terms of it's not tiring him out, you know, lesser chance of injury if he's maybe involved in that intense level, and he can go down to the under 21s and thrive there, and probably finds it really easy. Yeah. So that's nice to his confidence or whatever. But I would argue that he probably do, does deserve an England call up, and I I think it's crazy that he could go on and win the Premier League this season, maybe. You know, add that to the League Cup and and hopefully Europa League as well. And he maybe won't be in the England squad to to uh, for the for the, the tournament this summer. And I find that absolutely crazy, really. And I think if he played for a different club, maybe it probably wouldn't be the the case. In fact, it is probably likely as well that because Curtis Jones has had this poorly timed injury, that he doesn't go either. Which yeah. I, uh, you know, again, I mean, I, I look at England's midfield on paper and just think that. You know, I, I'm not mad on England. I don't know loads about it, but uh, you know, if, if you were to have Rice, Curtis Jones, and Bellingham, that to me on paper sounds like the most perfect midfield setup. You know, a, a holder who's playing yeah. really well for Arsenal at the moment, Bellingham absolutely flying for Real Madrid as your attacking one, and then Curtis Jones is an in between as a facilitator. And yeah, I, don't, I probably don't expect that he'll even be in the squad, which again, no. playing most weeks for a team that's that's doing what Liverpool are this yeah. season, and same with Harvey Elliott is just. Yeah, crazy, but there's benefits for Liverpool, as I say, and and, and and I'm sure those players will get recognition eventually, whether that's after Southgate leaves or whatever we'll have to see, but they, they definitely deserve it, I would say. Yeah, and it, it is a, a mixed one because you could see, like, Jurgen Klopp's talked about it, and Joe Gomez, you could see in his interview, was so proud about being there, but again, it's a, you know, Curtis Jones would love that, be great for them, but I'd just be like, please don't get injured. But that's all I'd be looking at realistically. So I get the split in a way that way. And I suppose another a player I wanted to, to ask you about, because I know you actually in the summer were the one really who got the scoop on Fabio Carvalho before he went to Red Bull. Obviously, he proved a bit ill-fated with everything that worked out. Quite a few interviews he seems to have given this week talking about his relationship with Klopp, what his aims are going forward as well. And, you know, he's got some lofty aims from his interview. There's no two ways about it at all. Do you think there is almost a future long-term for Cavalio at Liverpool or might have to be somewhere else, do you think? I think there's more of a chance now than there was, you know, maybe three or four months ago before we knew about the yeah. Klopp news. Absolutely. I think that's key. I think Klopp couldn't find a place for him in his setup, and And that's totally fair, by the way. I, I, you know, that's not a criticism because I don't think in the way that the club teams play football, he doesn't quite have the physicality for midfield at the moment. And also even on that, you know, he's not either got the, the pace for the, the wide positions either. So it's kind of been a struggle to think where he would have played. And that's why you're going to have that conversation with him over the summer and said, There's, there aren't really games for you here. I mean, in terms of going to Red Bull, that was very much sort of driven on the, the player and the agent side. Liverpool would have liked him to go somewhere else, maybe a, a, a move within England, in fact, similar to what he's ended up doing. Yeah. That was that. That was what Liverpool kind of wanted for him. So he pushed to go to Red Bull, and obviously didn't. It worked out pretty horribly in the end. But I, I still think he's showing that he's a, a really good player now. He's he, he's made the right low move in the end. And and, and as I say, that the, the, there could still be a future for him under a new manager because it could be easier in a different system, a different setup to to find a place for him. It's kind of interesting actually. Around the time he was. Looking at his loan move over the summer, someone said to me it was a sort of close to the situation that 
it'd been kind of said to Carvalho, look, go go out on loan. There might be a kind of different situation waiting for you when you got back. And when that was yeah. said to me, I, I kind of dismissed it at the time and didn't really think anything of it. And you think now with everything that's happened, that is exactly how it's played out. There is a very much yeah. a different situation playing out for him. So, you know, when he returns, he, he didn't necessarily need to make that permanent move in the summer. He will maybe get a, a, another chance under a new manager. So, Kind of interesting what you hear at the time, and, and yeah, didn't think anything of it. Maybe I was, I, I could have been early on the clock scoop there, but it's yeah, it's an interesting one. And I, I do think there's a there there is a chance for him when he comes back because, as I say, new manager, new system, new setup. So you know, may, maybe there is a chance he's got to keep playing well on loan and have a, yeah. a strong finish to the season, and then do well in pre season. But we know he's a talented player. Liverpool didn't sign him for for no reason, did they? So you know, every chance he he comes in and, and stakes a claim. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN Make sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, it will be interesting to see. It's almost like you said, he was never quite felt quick enough in this system to play in the front three, maybe lacking the physicality. and almost in a strange way against his pal Harvey Elliott, who has clearly gone on a level as well. So yeah, maybe regular football might do something for him. And probably the other the big story, I'd say, and the one that's you'll probably notice it, it's, it's caused a lot of furore with Reds. And understandably, I mean, whenever we have these chats, I know you're the one who brings the balance on the referees when I'm thinking a different thing and the fixture list when we saw those changes for April. I mean, three games in six days all the way, finishing with a half 12 on Saturday. With the way the calendar looks now, can you understand why there is that furore or a bit of upset around the fan base? Yeah, I mean, what's annoying, that that's really annoying when you get you get a Wednesday evening kickoff into a 12.30 because that yeah. whole thing happened, didn't it, around that not happening in the Champions League. Jürgen kicked up a fuss, BT or, or TNT as they are now changed exactly how that worked. And yet the Premier League seem intent on putting Liverpool in that sort of same amount of turnaround. So that's that's really frustrating. Um, there's you know no getting away from that. But they you know they don't they don't make the fish to list to try and do Liverpool over. I think you know the, the getting picked in the twelve thirty slot is you know Liverpool are attractive for broadcast. There's not a lot you can do about that. They're a big club, and this is part of the territory that comes with it. They've got a big squad, so they can rotate. So anyone who's taking this as a death knell for the season should maybe calm down a little bit. You know, I think the Liverpool can get through that with with making big changes, particularly as the squad is getting stronger now, uh, with 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 people coming back from injuries. So they can get through. But it, but I I, t- I agree, it's frustrating because, like I say, you know, you, you wouldn't get that in the Champions League doing a Wednesday evening kickoff and then into a twelve thirty on the Saturday. It wouldn't happen anymore. They've changed the rules, so. You know, maybe maybe Liverpool or, or other clubs should should be lobbying the Premier League to make sure that can't happen in Premier League fixtures as well. If it's such an issue, uh, the, the the upside is that the away game they've got on the Wednesdays is, is Everton, isn't it? So not a lot of travel around or, or any travel around that. Yeah. Uh, you know, literally across Stanley Park. So that's kind of helpful, I suppose. But yeah, it's um, it, it's not ideal, and and they probably won't be particularly happy about it. And, and maybe hope that that Arsenal can get through the Champions yeah, League yeah. and they get a bit of luck with that so that the West Ham game moves to the Sunday as well. So we'll we'll see how that one plays out. But Liverpool, look, it, 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 it's going to happen. They've got the squad to maybe get through it or we'll, we'll hope to. So, you know, it, it's a challenge and one they'll, 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 they'll be relishing and they'll, they'll think they can get through as well. And uh, one thing I will say actually in the 12.30s, they're really annoying after an international break 
because you you know you, you see with the likes of McAllister Nunez, you basically can't start them. They're ruled out because it's it's not feasible if they played a game on a certain day. Uh, the, the turnaround's too tight. And in fact, we saw McAllister was it Wolves away this season where yeah. he was disastrous. Yeah. He was so poor. So so they basically re- rules out re- you know really key players. So but when it's not after an international break, I actually think sometimes twelve thirty can be helpful. I think it dulls the atmosphere when you're away from home. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it makes it a little bit less testing in that sense. They're not great when you are at home and you need the atmosphere, but away from home, you know, they can go to West Ham in that 12.30 and think it's going to be a little bit quieter than usual. If you get an early goal, probably kills things completely. So, you, can, you know, there, there are some upsides in there. I always try and look for the positives and, uh, and maybe that maybe that's one of them. Yeah. And I suppose on positives and... Uh, Obviously, it was a bit horrendous the way it worked out before the international break. But actually going out of the FA Cup and not having to find that, could that be a bit of an advantage still? I know there's a sort of condensed period, but there will still be a midweek gap, as it were, at some point. Yeah, it's just one game less, isn't it? You know, you've got you've got to you've got to take that upside absolutely having that one game less in the semi final. I know the final itself would have come after the Europa League final if Liverpool were to get there. So. You know, we maybe discount that, but even then, I think that would have an effect on what your lineup for your final league game is, what your lineup for the Europa League final is. What you, you know, you would have to think about it because there's no way you could have used the same same team across those three games, and that that is something else to factor in. So, so it is, you know, it is taking two fixtures out of the the list potentially, and as you say, awful way to to go about going out of the mm-hmm. FA Cup. But you know, it, it, it's absolutely it, it, it can be helpful, and we know. Liverpool have been in this situation before where they've gone for all four competitions and it's got really, really difficult uh, towards the end of the season. Yeah. So to lose two fixtures is, you know, it can be a bit of a blessing in disguise and can be helpful in terms of, as you say, there's at least one free midweek there where they've not got a really difficult Premier League game. So that that can kind of be helpful and, and, and hopefully that provides that little extra physical boost they need towards the end of the season to get them over the line. No, Yeah, no doubts about it at all. It, it does look congested, but... We will see soon enough how that all works out. And the other thing that keeps coming up off the field is Javi Alonso talk's been raging for a while. It seemed like the the odds on favourite. The name Ruben Amarim, the Sporting Lisbon head coach, does seem very much in the last few days to have been mentioned by a a lot of people that comes round. I mean, I know you've always said that it would be Alonso that you'd lean towards. Do you think there is anything in this Amarim chat? Do you think it's almost Liverpool could be sort of hedging their bets? Because Bayern Munich have even started talking now about wanting Alonso and now Deservey's come into the mix, hasn't he, as mentioned publicly. Do you think that could be the case? Liverpool are just looking at the options. Yeah, I mean, I've, I think I mentioned Amarim when we first heard that Jürgen was leaving. I think he's absolutely nailed on to be on the list. The, the one thing I would never agree with is the idea that he's ahead of Alonso. I, I think if Liverpool can get Alonso, they will, because... His achievements at the moment this season are ridiculous. He did a good job at Real Sociedad B in terms of actually improving them as well, and even if that's in a sort of lesser environment. So it, 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 there's there's no doubt in my mind that, that, that Alonso will be the front runner and the, the main choice, but Amarim will be up there. I, I think he'd be number two behind him. Uh, that That's my belief and understanding because I think if he can't get Alonso, whether he, he prefers to stay at Bayer Leverkusen for another season, prefers to go to Bayern Munich, then Amarim will be the one that's in behind him. And I think, you know, not a bad second choice if that's where Liverpool yeah. end up because he's, you know, achieved a lot on a on a budget relative to his rivals in Portugal that isn't as big and plays a proactive style of football. He's a young manager, exciting. So ticks a lot of the boxes. So I, I think he absolutely will be in the mix. Um, you know, no surprise to, to hear that being talked about. But I do, I do expect Alonso to be to be the number one choice and, and, and hopefully Liverpool can get that one on the over the line. But if not... You know, they've got alternatives, they've got a backup there. It, it was what I wanted to ask you because, I mean, you, you were quite clear with the sporting director and the, the change of the structure when you expected that to happen. It was pretty much dead on with the timeline. This seems a lot more difficult just because we're Leverkusen, Sporting, we are and everything. Like, when would you think all fans should expect a timeline to sort of start formulating or things to start? Do we have to wait till the end of the season, do you think, on this? I just think it's going to maybe get to the position where if Leverkusen aren't competing for something with Alonso or, you know, say they get knocked out of the Europa League and and the, the league's wrapped up with, with a couple of weeks to go, then that's when you're going to start seeing firm moves. I think Liverpool are going to be very cautious of 
you know, moving too early, particularly when they could face by Leverkusen in the Europa League yeah. final, you know, that that's on the cards, isn't it? So, you know, they, they've got to be careful about how they do it. No doubt there's talks going on behind the scenes, getting in touch with agents, that absolutely can happen. But in terms of moving towards firm talks, I'd be really surprised if anything happened before the, the end of the season or before by Leverkusen season is, yeah. is over, so to speak, because it's just about respect, isn't it? And also, you know, you don't, you don't want to be providing that distraction or look like you're acting disrespectfully in, in going too early for things. I know, you know, I, I'm sure Alonso will know that Bayern Munich are doing a lot of talking in the press about the situation yeah. and I, surely that cannot be helping them. I don't really know why they're doing that. Um, uh, you know, if the, if the point they're trying to make is that they really want Alonso, I think Liverpool will do, will make that point privately rather than, than do it in any other way. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I expect that really to, to sort of move to, towards the end of the season. And, and, and as I say, whenever, Whenever Bayer Leverkusen a, a, a sort of you know finished up their season, then then they'll they'll make a firm move. I, I expect it's different that that German culture very much that sporting directors, people that buying on the board, speak out on names, don't they, and links like that. Even Plettenberg, like a, a big German journalist, has said that buying a favourites for him ahead of us. But then, as also this week mentioned, Deserby being looked at as well. So it does seem like a constant whirlwind around it. it will be one to watch and yeah interesting to see what happens there and the final thing I wanted to ask almost it kind of links to on the field but off the field as well Stefan Bajsetic has been teasing us all this week on his Instagram there's loads of photos he looks quite muscly again muscled up doesn't he back in training on the pitch more than anything hoping naturally that it was talked about but we've not seen a single photo of Curtis Jones yet back at you know at the AXA or training anything like that we're hoping Gravenberg is good to go. Is that kind of the latest injury news that we have? We're expecting Jones and Grav back for Brighton and just wait and see with Badge. Is that fair to say? Yeah, with Badge Hetic, I mean, even if he comes back to, to full training after the international break and maybe there's a possibility of that, I still think it's going to take time for him to, to fully get back up to speed or be in the mix for anything. I mean, really between now and the end of the season, you're hoping, you know, could he maybe start one Europa League game and and, and be in and around sort of, you know, being a, an option off the bench in the late in games to sort of help see them out and, and just give some rest to players. I don't think he's going to be like a, a bona fide option in, in sort of starting games in central midfield. So, but, but, but you know, obviously great to, to have him back. And with Curtis, yeah, I still think the expectation is to, to get him back for Brighton. I mean, you know, in terms of not seeing anything, I, I think by Chesic, they were just on his personal Instagram, weren't they? I don't think it was anything from the club yet. So still think that Curtis will be in and around that. And obviously Gravenberg back on the bench at Old Trafford. So that is great to, to have him back as an option. So Liverpool already immediately after the international break, starting to look a lot stronger and it's a, it's a good time of the season for that. And, you know, Jota and Trent not too far behind that Brighton game as well. So, you know, Liverpool looking in, in far better shape at the moment. And that is that is good news because you've got a crazy period coming up and a lot of very, very important games and every single player is going to be needed. They're going to have to rotate through this period. So having as many options as you can in every position is, is going to be absolutely massive. Yeah, Trent and Jossa could come back. That's two, That's a massive boost, isn't it, in time for that United game or around then anyway. That would be huge. So, yeah, there we go. Even in a, a week of internationals, there's been a lot happening and a lot suggested off the pitch. And a couple of special sections we're going to get into now with David. So the title race, we've kind of alluded to this. I mean, we're in this, this final bit. It's the eye of the storm. The fixtures are going to start coming thick and fast. I mean, about, we say, people say with 10 games left to go, that's when the race starts, don't they? And I know you said previously that you felt City were the favourites, but, you know, it really could go close. It's too close to call in that regard. I mean, looking at the fixtures that are left, we've talked about three and six days potentially. Is there any ones that you look at and think that could be a sticky one or one that you just keep your eye on, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean the, the one... I, I, I'm really concerned about obviously United and, and Everton away for Liverpool because they, they, they're they not easy places to play well at you know their crowd will always be up for it you know Liverpool saw didn't they, at, at Manchester United recently that they can lose their Everton again you know seen so many nil nils there down the years where, where Everton have been able to keep it tight and frustrate Liverpool so again expect that kind to be difficult but the, the fact is they're probably all going to be tricky aren't they because there's so much on the line at the moment I mean I look at Brighton and Sheffield United at home. And again, I'm probably just saying this out loud now and just cursing Liverpool. But, you know, that that's not a bad start, though. those back-to-back. No. -back. 
um, that that's a good way to get back into it. But but I think everything after that and and those three games in six days, as you say, that's going to be really testing. Going to require a lot of rotation. It's it's all it all looks difficult when you look at it like this, really. And um, yeah, mm. it, it, it's just a challenge, isn't it? The, the hope is that the other two their their fixtures can be tricky as well, um, and 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 there's difficult moments for them in there. So. It, it, it's it's all going to be a test, but it, but 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 looking forward to seeing how Liverpool approach it and how they how they rotate through it, what the squad looks like from game to game, because it you know Jurgen Klopp has proven in the past that he's very very good at getting through these periods. I mean, I had a look at sort of I'm previewing a YouTube video I'm going to do actually uh, today about uh, the the running and how it looks and Jurgen Klopp in terms of his average for for um, picking up points over the last ten games is you know way ahead of uh, he, he's got a better average than Guardiola and actually for uh, than the uh, Arteta's miles behind as well in fact in fact I'll, I'll drag these up actually I'll give you a little preview of this um because I think it, I do think it's interesting so um uh, so this is over the last four seasons basically the 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 their average over the last 10 games of each of the four seasons and Klopp has got the best with 24 Guardiola's 23.5 and Arteta's 16.5. So wow. Klopp's got the advantage there in terms of the average. So, you know, maybe that suggests that that, that puts Liverpool in a good position yeah. no matter how difficult the fixtures are, particularly when you consider that Liverpool have had some horrible seasons in those past four seasons as yeah. well So and still managed to do that. So definitely got a manager who can, can get them through this period by picking up a lot of points and, and, and they're going to have to, aren't they? Definitely. E- even in the horrendous season last season, we did finish quite strong overall. I know it wasn't quite enough to get in the Champions League, but it did feel a, a strong finish. I mean, looking at that in terms of positivity and even in terms of positivity, that it's not just a parade for City and Arsenal with the fixtures they've got. Is there any ones that you look at for them and thought when you were looking at the research that could be a bit sticky or difficult for them? Yeah, well, they've both got Spurs away, haven't they? Which I, I think is a tough one. Liverpool know that. Well, I say Liverpool know that. Liverpool would have won that game if they hadn't been uh, hit by the officials. But but still, that that can be a tricky one. I think Spurs have been really good this season. Obviously, Liverpool have got Spurs themselves, but it's at Anfield where you would really back them. Um, so so that's a, a a really tricky one for them. I, I still think you know there's there's a few tests in there, but you know Brighton away, both of them have got again is a is a really difficult one, and it's so so handy, isn't it? That that you know, they've got each other next week and that can really put the title race in Liverpool's hands. That is that is massively helpful. So, yeah, you know, no easy games in there. You know, Arsenal, as I say, a test for Arteta in terms of can he finish the season strongly, he hasn't yeah. typically done that at Arsenal, um, and particularly when the pressure's on. So, yeah, it, 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 it's going to be interesting. It's going to be it's going to be really tight, isn't it? Um, it? It almost makes you think as well, you know, with City being such strong finishes in general, would you take Arsenal winning that game on the basis that they'll probably drop points elsewhere and City are probably the likeliest to finish strong? So, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one. Yeah, next week it even starts, doesn't it? Next Sunday, and then, like like you said, there there is there is tough games for both sides, and we hope we hope they meet each other in the Champions League because that just maybe takes the eye off the ball there as well. So, yeah, we'll have a lot to see in those title race and the fixtures and. The other thing we wanted to do is a special section, a bit of a caveat awards, as we're calling it for this one. So we know the biggest part of the season is still to come. So things could change in regards to how we see players, the teams, things like that. No doubts about it at all. But we did want to get David to take on who we think are the, the players of the season today, the young players of the season today, even if we were looking at a team that was going to play the biggest game, who we would have in there. So we'll probably start with that in mind, David. So. Right at the top, as it stands now, in almost the top three sort of shortlist, if you want, the top contenders, who would be your top three contender, should we say, or player of the years as it stands right now for Liverpool? Yeah, so I think I think my top three for this is, I'll just say the three and then maybe we'll talk about it if, if there's an yeah. order. But I think um, for me, Alexis McAllister, Virgil van Dijk and, and Mohamed Salah. Now, with McAllister, obviously, I just think he's had an unbelievable impact. I didn't think he was... I knew he was a very good player and I really enjoyed watching him at the World Cup. But I thought, you know, the, the challenge of playing for Liverpool is a step up. It's a, a different style of football than he'd been playing yeah. at Brighton and with with Argentina as well. So, you know, it seemed like... It, to me, always I thought of him more as a sort of Guardiola-type player, really, in terms of the yeah. style of football. But he's really taken to this aggressive style of football. He's 
you know, one of the best pressers in that Liverpool midfield. He's yeah. so, so good on the ball as well. And I just like his character and everything about him. I think he's just been, just been, you know, just such a, such a good addition in terms of, he brings everything you want him to bring into, as I say, character and, and quality um, and, and just a great fit in the squad in general. He's just brought all that real winning mentality as well. And that always helps me bringing in a World Cup winner, I suppose. But he just he just really surprised me in the way he's, he's fitted in so nicely and, and the way he's played this style of football. And I think he's, you know, at the moment, I almost describe him as Liverpool's most important player in terms of, I just think if he's having a good game, Liverpool are playing well because he's in that central area where he can dictate things um, and, and, and they'd massively miss him if he was out. So fingers crossed he stays fit between now and the end of the season. And yeah, he's it, just been, yeah, a, a brilliant, brilliant debut season from him. I really enjoyed watching him play. Salah and Van Dijk, it, would they be a, ahead of McAllister just now for you? I know there's a lot of the season to play, but if you were sort of picking one right now, would they go ahead of McAllister? Yeah, so I'd probably, put, I'd probably put McAllister in third, I think, because I think these two have been just slightly more important than him in terms of, you know, I, I say McAllister most important in terms of general influence on games from game to game, I think he is. But in terms of overall form on the season, I think I think these two are just ahead of him. Um, and I would maybe put, I would maybe put Mohamed Salah in second because of the injury. He's missed, he's yeah. missed some games, hasn't he? And I think that is, you know, it's not his fault. And I'm not I saying that, so. he's, you know, he can't do anything about that. But I think he's very much, you know, he, he, he's still, regardless of that injury that he's had, he's still been unbelievably influential. I think uh, for me, you know, I'd, I'd almost say just out and out the best player in the Premier League in in terms of. You know, you look at his goals and assist numbers and where he's sat now, despite the fact he's missed so much football, he would be at the top, wouldn't he? Yeah. I think, you know, he would have scored more than Haaland scored. I think he would, have, if he did not miss so many games, I think he absolutely would have assisted more as well because he's, and he's he's much more involved in the game than Haaland is. You know, yeah. Haaland can have a really quiet game and score a hat-trick, whereas Salah, I think, can score that hat-trick, but he's involved in everything good that Liverpool do. He's a far better footballer than Haaland. That's, you know, it's not criticism of Haaland, who's absolutely magnificent, by the way, but I just think Salah is a better out-and-out footballer. He provides a lot yeah. more in his general game, and I think, you know, he's absolutely doing that. And the only thing that, like I say, it marks against him is, it, you know, it, this season, it, it may be not being my number one pick is is the injury that he's had, and if if he played more football, his numbers would be even more impressive. And as a, yeah, as I say, I believe he is he's probably the best player in the Premier League in those terms, and 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 yeah, been been absolutely wonderful this season. And then that obviously leaves Van Dijk as my top yeah. spot, and that is because I think he's you know after question marks around him last season has absolutely got back to his best. He's his influence on Liverpool's ability to play the high line, his organisation around everything else, and then there's just the sheer class he shows in everything he does defensively and on the ball. He's a brilliant leader and a great captain. He's he's already won a major trophy as Liverpool captain, hoping there's a couple more to come. Um, just everything you wanted him to be in terms of stepping into that void left by Jordan Henderson and got back to his best on the pitch as well. So, yeah, just just a, a phenomenal player, a pleasure to watch, and, and and a truly, truly great Liverpool captain in this early stages we're seeing so far. Hoping there's many, many more memories to come for him. Hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast, and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, AnfieldIndexPro.com. Join today. Sports Social Podcast Network.